Hey there, Flock. Mike here from Epic Duck Studios, and welcome to the Epic Hobby. Today I'm going to be painting up Hellboy from Mantic's Hellboy the Board Game in a Mike Mignola-inspired style. I'm going to be trying to keep as true as possible to the artwork on this stat card here, so really following Mike's vision of the Hellboy character. And I'm going to begin by just base coating all of his skin with corn red. I'll also be base coating his right hand of doom and his horns in the same red. Also, don't forget Hellboy's knees. They're exposed between the bits of clothing. Next, I'm going to use Citadel Deathworld Forest as a base coat for all of his clothing. Now this Hellboy model has a couple little trinkets hanging from his belt. I'm probably going to end up base coating over them here and I'll come back in with a yellow later to make them into a gold eventually. Next up, I'm going to use a tiny amount of Mechanicus Standard Grey, and this is literally just going to be a base coat for the little bit of his pistol you can see. Following that, I'm going to use Averland Sunset as a base coat for those little gold trinkets I mentioned earlier, as well as his eyes. I'm going to be framing his eyes in with some pretty heavy black ink later, so if you end up painting the area a little bit too large, don't really worry about it right now. It's okay to overdo the eye. Next, I'm going to use Citadel Mephist in red to add highlights to all of the red areas. Now, Mike Magnola's artwork varies between having no highlights at all and having basically one level of pretty subtle highlights. This is almost more of a concession I'm making to it being a tabletop gaming piece where highlights just help the model stand out a little more on the table. If you wanted to paint this a little more simply, you could have just used Mephist in Red as the base coat for the skin and not really done any highlighting at all. So with these highlights, I'm trying to look at the model from roughly a three-quarter angle, so not quite straight down, though you'll see me pitch to that occasionally. And more or less, any red areas I can see at that angle, except for really, really deep grooves, are what I'm highlighting. So you can see sort of like in his elbow there, I've left some of the darker red showing and up around the bicep as well. But for the most part, if it's towards the top of the model, it's going to become a brighter red. Now with this being inspired by a comic book, highlighting for dramatic effect is more important than highlighting for realism. So if a highlight makes sense to put somewhere to draw attention to a detail, even if it's in a bit of a shadow, it still makes sense to do it because our source material would do so. So one thing to remember here is that I'm going to be bringing in a lot of black ink later, both because that's how I like to approach comic style, but particularly because it's very integral to Mike Magnola's artwork, which is what I'm using as my inspiration here. So what that means is it's okay if a couple adjacent details don't have a little bit of the darker red showing between them. Like for example, when I was working on his fist, you could see that I basically just swathed the whole thing in the light red. And that's because they're really small details and I know I'm going to be bringing in some black lines between them. So 
So next up, I'm going to highlight his clothing. I'm going to be mixing a little bit of Citadel Wraithbone into the Deathworld Forest that I used to base coat the clothing, and leaning much more towards the Wraithbone side, and I'll be using this to highlight all of the clothing at this point. I'm going to be leaving a lot of significant areas of the Deathworld Forest though, because the clothing I feel is sort of a less impactful part of the model, and you know I'm going to really probably hit it with a lot of black ink because there's a lot of Compared to his skin, it's a very detail-focused area. You can see there's a lot of small folds, a lot of little, like, gribbly bits to it, as opposed to his skin, which is nice, big, smooth, open surfaces. And so I know I'm going to be working a lot of black ink in here, and I'm just going to leave a lot of it unhighlighted to make room for that. Next, I'll be using some Warcolors One Coat Yellow to just bring some brightness to his eyes and then make the little trinkets around his belt look more golden and more lively. Warcolors One Coat Yellow is basically my favorite yellow paint. It's very, very bright. It's kind of in the same range as like a Flash Gets Yellow, but it is incredibly opaque, especially for how saturated it is. Yellow paints tend to be more on the translucent side, and this one thankfully just isn't. Even if you never buy another Warcolors paint, this is a really good one to have. To highlight Hellboy's pistol, I'm going to use just a little hint of Celestra Grey. Alright, now we get into the really fun part of this model, working in all the black detail that basically makes it look like a Mike Mignola piece. I'm going to be using Haken's Black Magic Drawing Ink and a Pigma Micron 03 Archival Ink Pen. I'm going to start using the Haken's Black Magic and just bulking in the biggest shadows. So that's going to be everything kind of on the underside of the model. So you can see I'm you know, working in his armpit, working in the bottom of his arm, even the underside of his fist right out to the knuckles. Huge areas of black are very integral to how Mike approaches his art style, and I'm going to be really taking advantage of that with this miniature. Now this is a pretty common way I approach comic style, is the area between the legs, I almost always make pure black, and the reason for that is you get a nice silhouette line when you view the model more or less straight on, and even from certain angles. So once it's done, you'll basically see when you look at the model, it looks like the lines around the leg are drawn into place, and really it's just that the inner surface of each leg is completely filled with black. This is also the same reason why I underline arms almost entirely with black magic as well, because it creates the impression of a line drawn underneath the arm. So here I'm just carrying that black on the foot a little bit further forward so that it helps define that, you know, the sort of the faux outline around the leg. And now I'm working the black ink under his right arm, and you'll see I'll bring this again all the way out to the edge of the hand, and I'm not leaving any sort of highlights whatsoever. You know, there's, there's no hint of red even on the edge of a really sharp detail, like the rings around the Fist of Doom. So here now I'm looking at the arm from that sort of three-quarter angle, and I'm making sure that the black comes out far enough to create that impression of an outline. That's really why I'm holding the model still at this angle and kind of working the ink out from underneath it and then sort of forward, is to make sure I really get that nice crisp black line when the model's viewed from very specific angles. Now I'm switching over to the Micron pen, and this is basically just because it's a little bit faster because you obviously don't have to keep going back to a pot and washing it and so on. And I'm just going to use this to rough in most of the line around his muscle definition. You know, areas where the pen can reach easily and, you know, I maybe want a tinier, more controlled line. Unfortunately, there's some areas that you just can't work with a pen. For example, I can't really use this on his face because the nub is too big to work around his eyes. And then there's areas like between his legs, you literally just can't reach with a pen because the body of the pen starts to bump into the model at that point. 
But areas here, like the big muscles on his chest and, you know, around his biceps, elbow, and stuff like that, all those areas, a pen is actually perfect for. And the only thing is, the only concession is with the pen, you do have to hold it very gently. And I say that because what can happen is the pen nub is actually much rougher and much stiffer than a paintbrush is. And so if you apply too much pressure, you can actually start to scratch the paint off the model. You can actually scratch right down to the primer. So you just, as you're using the pen, you have to hold it very, very lightly and be very aware that you're using it on a textured, you know, non-flat surface. We're all very, very used to using pens and markers on flat things like books and paper. But it's a little bit of a different story when you're using them on a three-dimensional object. Still, you can crank out a lot of the shadows on this. You can even see I'm using it to fill in the leg a little bit here because, you know, in this particular angle, the model's not in its own way. You know, some parts of the underneath, like especially between the legs, you know, up underneath the tail, I just could not reach with a pen. But certainly the back of that ankle um, was a definitely easy to reach area. You can see here as I'm trying to sort of create, you know, some shape around his shoulder blades, the pen is perfect for this. The other reason I initially started using the pen didn't actually pan out, but when you look at Mike Mignola's artwork, his inking is actually done with very, very consistent line thicknesses. It's actually very, very telling of his artwork. You can more or less identify whether he's drawn something by the line work itself, even without color, without shading. And I was hoping that by using a pen, my lines would be very consistent and would even more closely emulate that Mike Mignola style. But ultimately, a pen on a three-dimensional surface doesn't behave quite the same way, so as you lift the pen, it does taper off a little bit. So you don't get quite the same look of uniformity to the lines that you would get, you know, on, like say, on paper or on a flat surface. It does help with that a little bit, but not enough to warrant using the pen exclusively. This is about where I reached the end of what I thought I could safely do with the pen, and I switched back to using the Higgins Black Magic, but I've now come in with a much smaller brush. This is a triple zero foil brush from Game Envy's Artist Arsenal brushes, and I personally work with Kit to pick these out for Game Envy because I use this particular brush so much in my comic style work. I mean, I use them in my regular painting as well, but I just found they were so well suited to creating all the fine line work that I really require, and thought if they're good enough for that, they're good enough for just about anything. So now using the black ink, I'm going to block out all of Hellboy's hair and his goatee. It's worth noting that there is literally no shading done to his hair, it's just left pure black. So now I'm framing the eyes in, and to start that, I'm painting the underside of his eyebrows because those really overhang the eye and need a nice deep shadow to just stand off the face properly. And I'm bringing that deep shadow all the way back to the eye. After that, I carefully underline each eye, basically just with a single thin line. Unfortunately, his horns kind of actually block this from showing up on camera, but I hope the sort of care you can see that I'm taking at least indicates the level of precision I'm trying to get with the eyes here. I'm also tracing a small black line just across the top of his bottom lip. Now I'm working in some smaller details, like sort of creating the shape of his cheekbones and a little bit of a wrinkle in the middle of his forehead where his two eyebrows sort of meet. Outlining the base of the horns from the skull. 
And lastly, adding a deep shadow on the underside of his horns. Now there's going to be two here. There's going to be one basically where the skull attaches to the horn, and the second one where the horn curls back again. I come back and add that second shadow at a little bit later time. Next I'm going to begin by detailing his fist by basically just separating the fingers from each other with some black lines. Otherwise, they can pretty much stay intact. Now Hellboy's right hand is certainly one of his most iconic features and certainly the most detailed part about him. Right now I'm just adding some quick lines around the rings on the fist, but I'll be back to add a lot more detail to it shortly. One thing I like to do with my comic style inking is basically move around the model quite frequently, and the reason for that is it keeps me from getting super focused on any one detail for too long. Because I find if I spend too long looking at detail, it's really possible for me to get really overzealous with how much black inking I do in an area. Whereas if I kind of bounce around the model, spend a little time on his knee, then you know go up to his left hand, go up to his right hand, go back to his chest, move to his back, go to his right knee, kind of you know just bounce my way around the model like that. I find my inking ends up being a little more consistent because I'm not really giving any one part like a hyper focused amount of attention. The exception being the face because in general the face deserves to have a lot more attention on a model than almost anything else. So here I'm working my way around Hellboy's feet to make sure there's a nice dark line distinguishing them from the base he's standing on. Now of course at this moment the base is completely undetailed, but that'll be fixed later. Here I'm just adding some small strokes kind of coming into the shadow between his legs just to give the impression that there's more folds in the fabric making up his boots here. Is it still a boot if it's open-toed? The line work on his clothing is all pretty self-explanatory, you know, just working my way around, sort of isolating details from each other. There's a lot of very obviously distinct parts of his clothing. Like for example, it's pretty clear that he's got basically a whole trench coat just kind of balled up around his waist and there's just all sorts of stuff hanging off of it. And you just kind of go with it, you know, just go around and outline the individual details, keep them separate from each other and add the deep black shadows underneath basically everything. There's also a lot of folds in the fabric, and you can use that just to bring in a lot of nice small line work, which just helps sell the fact that it looks kind of comic-y. It's interesting to see how much darker this model looks when viewed from below like this than when looked at from above. In general, I think that's a really good indicator that you're handling your comic style correctly because it means that the line work and the shadows are really working in your favor to draw the eye to the top of the model. All right, there's those little shadows on the back of the horn. I knew I got them eventually. So now I'm going through where I have all these different folds in the fabric and kind of linking some of them together to make bigger, darker areas, because that's really very true of Mike Mignola's artwork, is just these large blocks of black that just mask areas that are just kind of ultimately unimportant to a model. So you can see here I'm working more shadows in around his tail and kind of just in the back of his thigh and so on. Okay, now we're back to the right-handed doom and I'm going to be going around and isolating each of those rings that go all the way around it, making sure there's a nice thick line delineating each of these because they're a pretty crucial detail. The same is going to happen with little circular kind of puck-shaped knuckles he has. I'm being pretty slow and deliberate here because I want to make sure my line weight is the same all the way around the model and for all four of these lines I have to draw because there are two of these rings and I want to make sure they're each covered from both angles so you know the left side and right side of each of these and the line weight is pretty consistent I don't want one to look heavier or more shadowed than the other.
Now I'm going to start isolating the fingers and working my way around the knuckles as well. So you can see when looking at the bottom of his hand that the whole bottom finger is actually completely enveloped in shadow. You don't see any of it at all. And that's perfectly fine. You know, that's, again, we're going back to Mike's artwork style where heavy areas of black are really, really crucial to his visual language. And so we're making use of that and also saving ourselves some painting in the process because that's a finger we don't have to do any highlighting on. So here I'm working around the last of the knuckles and each of these knuckles is basically a small little raised disc. And what I'm doing is I'm painting the entire outside rim of that disc in black. This leaves the actual flat surface of the knuckle alone and makes sure you get a nice crisp circle when viewed from almost every angle. Now I'm just bulking up some shadows again, kind of connecting them together and making them just a little bit heavier. This is one of very few freehand lines I paint on the model, basically just to delineate some musculature in his forearm. One thing that sets the Hellboy art style apart from every other comic style piece I've done so far is there is no cross-hatching done. That is not a way that Mike Bangdola produces his shadows. They're thick, heavy shadows, or they're not at all. And so you'll see I'm not doing any of my normal cross-hatching on this model. None whatsoever. All right, there is Horned Hellboy from Mantix Hellboy the board game. I hope you guys really enjoyed this tutorial because I had a lot of fun making it. This was probably one of my favorite comic style models to date. Hey, thanks for watching my video. If you enjoyed that one, please hit like and subscribe and don't forget to hit the bell icon so you get notifications when I post new content in the future. If you want to take your support even further, you can do so at patreon.com slash epic duck. Every little bit helps me keep the lights on and the paint flowing, puts new models on the table so I can make interesting videos, and most importantly, keeps a roof over my family's head and food on the table. Honestly, Patreon is what makes doing this every single day possible. You can also catch me six times a week at twitch.tv slash epicduckstudios. I'd really love it if you came by to watch my show sometime and click follow. A big thank you to everyone who supported my stuff, both past and present, over the years. It's been a wild ride, and I couldn't do this without the fans and all of the wonderful flockers out there. The hobby community is just an amazing group of people, and you make this worth doing. So let's keep doing this together for years to come. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, do something epic.